All right, guys. It is a cold, blustery day here in the uh, in the collapse of global industrial civilization, where I am uh, hiding out with my little my little raccoon dog. Oops, my little raccoon dog has been exposed. So anyway, uh, Sancho Panza wants to apologize for. Uh, causing that little upset a few years ago. But anyway, the pangolins have gotten a break. Yes, the, the pangolins have gotten a break. Sancho Panza is the reason, uh, <laughs> is the reason that the planet has been a little bit, uh, a little bit, what did you do to this planet for three years, your little guilty raccoon dog? Oh, God. Anyway, I think we all know what the biggest story on the planet <laughs> from the New York Times is, is the raccoon dog. Good Lord, this north wind on this winter day. But it is a, uh, it is now a Saturday, feeling like January 18th. I guess it's March 18th in the uh, Arctic Blast in the great state of Texas. So while a, what is it, a 5,000 mile by 300 mile blob of seaweed uh, heading towards Florida today. Uh, <laughs> what, what does the, what does the planet need for a wake up call? I have got to block this wind. Oh, Jesus Christ. So, uh, I need to head back to the biggest party on the planet uh, here in this Arctic blast here on March 18th. It is the same, pretty much the same temperature in Texas as it is in New York today. Well, uh, what was I saying? Oh yeah, so we have a 5,000 mile by 300 mile blob of... Uh, <laughs> of seaweed heading towards Florida. You know, I was in that shit down in Playa del Carmen, Mexico just a couple of weeks ago. And it's some nasty stuff. Can you say hydrogen sulfide? Uh, I don't know how much hydrogen sulfide gas a 5,000 mile uh, bed of seaweed uh, what, what that's going to do uh, to the good citizens of Florida. It'll make red tide seem like a bad hair day in comparison. But anyway, while we, while we wait for uh, Florida to be buried in a, in a mountain of rotten seaweed, uh, let's see what else is going on on this planet today. So what we're going to do today, I guess we're going to do the uh, the frying pan and the fire. This is the we have both the frying pan and the fire uh, here on the mainstream media news today. So uh, I don't know whether this I I never is this the frying pan or is this the fire? You tell me. Uh, well, what a surprise! We have a new government report. Uh huh. So we're going to call this, I guess, the frying pan. Uh, U.S. oil production will remain at, quote, historically high volumes through 2050, according to a new government report despite his campaign rhetoric of ending fossil fuels, President Joe Biden acknowledged in his recent State of the Union address that, quote, we are going to need oil for at least another decade. And I think he said kind of out of the reach of the microphone, and he added a few decades. That was probably the one thing out of Joe Biden's mouth in the State of the Union that was not a bold-faced lie. But a new report <coughs> uh, 
released Thursday by an independent agency of Biden's own government projects it will even be much longer than that, meaning a lot longer than, uh, than one decade. In fact, the 2023 annual energy outlook from the Energy Information Administration finds that U.S. oil production may even increase huh, between now and 2050, even as clean energy sources like wind and solar power increase dramatically as well. Thank you, uh, the U.S. government, uh, Energy uh, Information Administration, trying to explain this to clueless morons who do not understand the concept of the growing pie. One more time, let's try to explain what the EIA is telling you. Even if solar and wind and all of this other bullshit, uh, which is every bit as bad for the planet as fossil fuels, even if the total amount of, uh, of all of this shit grows, if the entire pie is getting bigger and bigger and bigger uh, as the demand for all kinds of energy gets bigger and bigger and bigger. It's not like this, this BS renewable clean energy is, is taking a bigger amount of the pie. The whole pie is getting bigger. It's not either or. It is both and it is this is it, I know this is tough and this is why you know extrapolating this even further it is both the frying pan and the fire everybody is right everybody is right this is not a debate this is just it's just a compilation is what I call this from both sides of the frying pan. But we're going to get to the fire in a minute. Let's finish out the frying pan here. Um, okay, where were we that, about how oil production may even increase between now and 2050, even as clean energy sources increase dramatically as well. All of this shit's going to increase. All right. <clears throat> the analysts say that U.S. demand for oil and gas is likely to remain remarkably steady for decades. And, quote, we expect U.S. production to remain at historically high volumes as exports of finished products grow, close quote said uh, Angelina LaRose, EIA Assistant Administry, Administrator for Energy Analysis, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so what she's referring to here is don't forget that oil is in all of this other crap. It's not just oil. Can you say plastics, for instance? Anyway, the EIA is an independent government agency that prepared this week's report without the input of the White House or other officials. Their predictions have also been echoed by outside, other outside experts in recent months, and they link you over to that. But Thursday's release marks an official government acknowledgement of the widespread expectation that U.S. oil and gas production is not likely to wane anytime soon. <clears throat> the U.S. currently produces about 20 million barrels of oil per day. Looking to 2050, the EIA analysts see the possibility of one quote, high oil and gas supply scenario where, where that number jumps to around 30 million barrels per day in 2050. Production 
<clears throat> stays steady or goes down slightly in other models, but in every case that the analysts model, the U.S. will remain a net exporter of petroleum products and natural gas through 2050. The newly released report is likely to be often cited by President Biden's Republican critics, many of whom jeered when he made his State of the Union prediction. GOP and industry critics say that Biden and his aides constant downplaying of the future for oil and gas companies has made companies fearful of investing for the future. Yes, the report also comes in the wake of a Biden administration to approve ConocoPhillips Willow Drilling Project in Alaska, which will produce new oil for years. So, uh, you know, guys, I have been, uh, you know, when I was first going down this rabbit hole, you, you, you know, in 2008, when I started uh, waking up to this information, I immediately jumped into the peak oil bandwagon. Uh, that was now 15 years ago. Uh, I climbed up on the peak oil fence probably four or five years ago, and I'm pretty much, oh boy, here I go. You know, it's one of these where I have some fun. Andy the gardener, come at me. Uh, I am agreeing with this. I, uh, I, I will agree. So in 2050, I am going to be 91. I think uh, Andy the Gardener is going to be, what, what are you going to be, Andy, uh, 79 or is it 83? But anyway, uh, we will, does anyone want to make a bet with me right now? I will wager uh, the price of a barrel of oil in 2050 uh, that the United States will be pumping as much oil in the year 2050 as it is now. Uh, I'm t I, I see no reason why it's not. I am a, a officially today, Sam Mitchell at Collapse Chronicles is hopping off the peak oil fence. I've gone from the peak oil, what do we call it, the peak oil pit, to the peak oil fence, and now I am uh, I am throwing my hat in the EIA ring. But anyway, that's so uh, we have the frying pan uh, going full speed ahead. The frying pan is going nowhere between now and 2050. The frying pan portion of the fire is going to keep growing, but I, I, I but you know, any of it, uh, since there's no difference in the environmental impacts of fossil fuels or all this other crap, I put that all in the frying pan. So like, like instead of the pie is growing bigger, the frying pan not only uh, are, are, we got, are, are we not uh, going to be out of the frying pan into the fire? Uh, we're just going to have one foot in an ever-growing, bigger frying pan. All of this crap is going to kill the planet. Okay? If you have 8 billion or more people uh, screaming for more and more, so let's go over to the fire, which of course is, this is Time Magazine talking about this, is what uh, those crazy conspiracy uh, wackos would call chemtrails, and we call solar radiation management. Uh, I think they have a new word for it in Time Magazine. A controversial technology is creating an unprecedented rift 
among climate scientists. I will put the link on here, and I'm just going to read a little bit of this, and you can uh, take it from here. Uh, blah, 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 blah. Many scientists have long thought of experiments to inject chemicals into the Earth's atmosphere in order to cool the climate known as stratospheric aerosol injection is what they're calling it. SAI is falling within the taboo technology category, arguing that developing the technology could pose serious planetary risks, which is exactly what it could do. It could set off as much moving out of the, you know what I'm saying, uh, mo mo trying to move out of the frying pan into the fire uh, with, with this crap uh, could prove every bit as disastrous as what they're trying to fix uh, because there is no solution to the problem of ever rising energy demand other than having the number of humans making them demand get smaller and smaller. Yes. So anyway, so you got that side, you know, from the beginning, which we've been talking about for years here, arguing that developing the technology could pose serious planetary risk, but some climate researchers have been working to alter that perception in recent years splitting the science community. In recent months, the field, you know, in support of solar radiation management or stratospheric aerosol injection or chemtrails, whatever you want to call this crap, um, that uh, the, when they talk about you know, that field has seen a surge in momentum Last month, the UN Environment Program called for more research into geoengineering, while reports emerged last summer that the Biden administration has begun coordinating a five-year research plan. Uh, meanwhile, rogue researchers and Silicon Valley entrepreneurs, meanwhile, have conducted small-scale tests despite Comden, con condemnation from much of the scientific community. All that attention has added fuel. Well, maybe this is the fire. Yes, that's right, this is the fire. Okay, we are at the fire. I keep forgetting, are we at the frying pan or the fire? Uh, all that attention has added fuel to the smoldering disagreements among climate scientists creating what is likely the most significant rift in the world of atmospheric science and climate studies in years. Uh, academic factions have published a series of dueling petitions as part of an increasingly visible and contentious battle for control of the scientific narrative and ultimately over how to tackle climate change as emissions continue to rise. Okay, so one side says that humanity may doom itself by refusing to look into potential chemical means of cooling our atmosphere. And they are 100% correct. Uh, Paul Beckwith, uh, if you listen to Paul, I'm pretty sure, well, Paul used to be, you know, when Paul was still speaking to me, uh, when last time I talked to Paul at the end of our conversation, we got into this a little bit, uh, so I'm pretty sure that Paul Beckwith is still a, he's in that camp, that at this point, if we don't jump into the fire, the frying pan's going to kill us. And uh, he is exactly correct. The other side claims that undertaking such research could lead to disastrous consequences that we can barely 
imagine. And they are exactly right. This is why we are damned if we do, damned if we don't, as far as the chemtrail thing. And this is why, I, you know, until recently, I've, I have been characterizing this as frying pan or the fire. Uh, it, it, it's all of it, guys. Do you get it? Both sides of that debate are right. If we don't start uh, squirting this crap up there, we're, we're doomed. If we do start squirting this crap up there, we're doomed. Uh, if we stick with fossil fuels, which we're going to do, we're doomed. If we move over to the, this bullshit renewables, we're doomed. So we're doomed or we're doomed on one side, and we're doomed or we're doomed on the other side. So we're doomed or we're doomed or we're doomed or we're doomed. You know, all, all of these false debates we're having, everybody is right. You know, when, when everybody is, is right, uh, who's wrong? Uh, it's time for us to admit that we're doomed. It doesn't matter where you go, we're doomed. So I do need to put a little asterisk, I, I guess, you know, uh, talking about, uh, about all of this oil we're still going to be pumping in the year 2050. And when I was talking to my buddy Elliot Jacobson uh, a few days ago, we were talking about my interview uh, with Tim Garrett, which you can find here uh, in my interviews playlist. <coughs> and you know where where Tim, uh, you know what he was saying uh, that 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 it has to come down between now and 2050. That at some point between now and 2050, that it's game over. That it's game over, and, and uh, Sancho says it's bye bye. It is game over. Goodbye. Uh, bye bye. Uh, so obviously, uh, when, not if, when Tim Garrett's uh, prediction happens that this whole thing come that something's got to give when it does give and this whole shit show does come down between now and 2050 then then i guess uh the the whoever's betting me the price of a barrel of oil uh in the year 2050 uh might win the bet uh because we will not be pumping but, but that, the, the only way we're not going to be pumping as much oil in 2050 uh, as we are now has nothing to do with running out of oil. Nothing whatsoever to do with running out of oil, with stranded assets, with any of this happy horseshit. Uh, there, there, there's one way uh, that we're not going to be pumping all of this oil, and that's when we don't have the demand for the oil. And we will not have the demand for the oil when global industrial civilization does collapse and uh, hopefully 90% of the planet will go poof uh, within six weeks of that happening. But right now it is freezing and uh, I have to go party. I have to go burn some oil in my gas sucking truck and go party like it's 1999 take my little raccoon dog. You get to go to the party tonight like that. You get to go to the party. The little dog gets to go to the party tonight. Go and do a picking party. Get out there and uh, party like it's 1999 on this cold winter day while you still can. My guys. <laughs>